Have you ever experienced betrayal from your partner or maybe been accused of potentially betraying your partner because you're naturally flirtatious? Today's guest, Laura Cheadle, is going to cover the whole range of this topic of betrayal in a relationship and how to love your way through it. Join us to find out more. Join us on this beautiful journey. So let the show. So let the show. Before we start this episode, I, Carrie Hummingbird, and I, Akeem Sami, want you to know that you are invited. You're invited to, to join, join Soul Nectar, Nectar Tribe. Tribe. If you like what you hear on Soul Nectar Show, you will love being in person with us in Soul Nectar Tribe. We invite you to check it out. First 30 days is free. Right now, go to carryhummingbird.com, K-E-R-R-I, hummingbird.com, forward slash membership, and sign up. We'll We'll see see you at at our our next tribe tribe gathering. gathering. And now... On to the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, to the great mystery beyond the veil, to those synchronistic moments that lead us inexorably towards a deeper understanding of ourselves and this human experience that we are having as souls incarnated into a body. I am your host, Carrie Hummingbird, and of course, I love these kinds of conversations. And the most important thing for me, really, when I'm venturing into a topic like we're going to talk about today, is really understanding what's the lens through which the I am encountering the topic. Because today's topic is one that, for some people, having had this experience could bring up triggers, could bring up judgments, could bring up past painful wounds. And for some people, maybe that don't listen to my show a lot, you might want to avoid those topics. I'm just giving you a heads up that today we're going to be talking about something really, really sensitive, and that is betrayal. That is when your partner betrays you with other partners and you find out about it later and it's heartbreaking. And then what do you do? And then where do you go? And then what's there for you? And in the work that I do with clients, the work I'd love to do is all about understanding what's happening to you is actually happening for you, through you, even the most painful things like betrayal is here for you to expand you, to deepen your understanding of yourself, to strengthen you, to course correct. You know, maybe there's some underlying dynamics that are causing this betrayal and it can be course corrected. And for a lot of people, betrayal leads to the end of the relationship. And today's guest has turned a corner on that. So that's even more fascinating. It's like, wow, you mean it's not the end? You mean there's more? You mean I don't have to completely kill somebody from my life because they make some mistakes? I can actually allow, accept, and embrace that, grow from it, and grow my relationship through that? Wow, now that's cool. And so now that I've set it all up, you guys know, if you're still listening, you're in now. So buckle up. Today's guest is Laura Cheadle. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. So glad you're here. So Laura is an attorney, um, a TEDx speaker, a life and leadership coach, and she shows individuals how to move beyond soothing the symptoms of burnout and resolve the root cause, which is oftentimes betrayal, whether you have betrayed been betrayed by your body, as many people feel with COVID, betrayed by your body, your life, or by someone you love. 
Laura can show you how to break free from the heartbreak, overcome obsessive thoughts, and turn your devastation into a reclamation of all that you are and all that you are worth so you can find the meaning and satisfaction that you actually crave. She's the author of the award-winning book, Flaunt, Drop Your Cover and Reveal Your Smart, Sexy, and Spiritual Self. And she's got a podcast too called Flaunt, Create a Life You Love After Infidelity or Betrayal. And actually working on the next book, which is that part that I hinted at, that healing the relationship aspect. So super, super cool. So I've already kind of revealed a little about what got you started in your work, but tell us more, you know, tell us more about you and about how you believe all this came about in your life for you to bring this into the world as a mentor, as a coach. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you for all of that. That was beautifully set up with such integrity. I appreciate that. I uh, was a former corporate attorney. I met my husband in law school and we just, you know, blossomed into life that everything was going to be perfect. We were this great you know, couple. We had similar dreams. Everything was going to be amazing. Uh, had got married, had two kids. I ended up leaving work for a variety of reasons and started coaching and stayed home for a while. During that time, I supported him in everything he did. You know, I stepped back from my career because, in part, he was traveling all the time. And as you know, if you've ever been married or had kids, you can't have two people working full time and traveling full time without a lot of challenges. So I thought, that's okay. I will take care of everything. I will do everything for everyone. And I'm just going to support him. And I will be the perfect wife and the perfect mom. And life is going to be amazing. Which right there is the big setup. After 23 years of what I truly, in my heart, in my soul, thought was a really good relationship and a really solid marriage, I found out that he had been cheating with one person. And that was awful. And then about six months later, I found out that, oh no, he had been cheating with two people and that this affair had lasted 15 years. And then a week later, I found out that there were affair partners three, four, and five, and that this 15 year stretch in our marriage, he had never been faithful, that nothing I thought to be true was true, that this dream we were working together on building, mm -mm, we weren't, I was the only one in that game. And it truly threatened to destroy me because everything I knew to be true wasn't true. And it caused me to question myself, my worth, like every single happy memory. Was that really a happy memory? Or was he lying? And if he's lying about this, what else is he lying about? It was awful to make matters worse. As I found out, we were having a struggle with his phone because that's where I got some of the information. And he stepped on my foot as I walk, went to walk away and I broke my foot. So not only am I emotionally crippled, <laughs> energetically crippled, now I am literally physically crippled as well. So it was the worst time in my life by a long shot. And initially it was, nope, we're done. He left. I'm out of here. We were starting to have some conversations originally. And it was, I did this because it's your fault. You know, you did this. I'm not to blame. Somewhere about maybe a month in, he came over and said, it still makes me cry. This isn't you. I am terribly broken somehow. And this had nothing to do with you. And I don't, I don't know why, but I just need you to know it wasn't you. And from that point on, then it was like, okay, that's, that's game on. What, what is it in you? What was it in me that attracted this? If anything, what is it with you? How can we talk? And I started getting really curious because there always was love there on both sides. And there still was love there on both sides. There was a whole lot of anger, <laughs> but there was also love. And then that curiosity of 
how can you be this person? How could I be so wrong that I thought you were this ethical, wonderful human and you're not what's going on. And that curiosity really led me in and spirit led me in. And from that point forward, we started having some incredibly raw and incredibly conversation, good, vulnerable conversations like we had never had before. And started, he started revealing things about himself that I didn't know, emotions that he was having that he never shared, thoughts, ideas. And I started doing the same. And I mean, there, there, there's so much to that. But long story short, I saw him as strong and brilliant and unbreakable. And he saw me as amazing and loving and powerful. And we saw each other in a way as these kind of untouchable people. So we were always protecting our hearts because neither of us really felt worthy for the other. So we were always striving. And because we were always covering, because we were always striving to be good for the other person, we never dropped in. We never grounded. We never connected. We never got naked and raw and vulnerable with each other until this experience happened. And then once this experience happened, that's when this all came out on the table. Okay, let me, let, <laughs> let me just tell you all of my shadow parts. Uh, here they are. Here they are. I don't know what to do with them, but here they are. And that's where we really started to heal, not only ourselves, but the relationship. And I wanted to add too that as we were doing this work, the intention wasn't necessarily to rebuild our relationship. The intention was to see what was there, to dig to the bottom and to clean out the sewer. Yeah, that's so powerful. Laura, like what a beautiful expression of that, that journey of vulnerability and transparency, opening up the throat chakra, having those conversations that we are terrified to have that expose us, that are feel really uncomfortable and threatening in some way to open up a dialogue around. It's like insane. I can relate to that part. Um, I, I just never, in my relationship, I think a lot of the challenges were related to just discomfort talking about certain topics, like mm -hmm. especially sexuality or intimacy. You know, it was kind of like, um, I just want to get it over with because I don't want to be there long enough to be that uncomfortable in the topic that like, hey, this isn't really working for me and I don't know how to make it work for me. And so I'll just put that aside and let's just do something else, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, you know, that doesn't lead to, it doesn't lead to that transparency, but there's also like, besides just having topics that you're personally uncomfortable talking about, there's also like this, um, well, it depends on the nature of the relationship, right? Like if you feel like talking about something that you feel weak about is going to cause some kind of attack or criticism, like now you're not perfect anymore, yes. that really shuts things down, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you're not living as who you really are. You know, you can never, you can never relax. You can never really truly connect. And we need to be able to have these conversations in, especially in our most intimate relationship, mm -hmm. but those seem like the hardest places to have those conversations. Like it's so much easier to go to a girlfriend and tell the girlfriend like how you're feeling yes. than it is to like tell your partner how you're feeling. Yes. Absolutely. And there's so many, you know, underlying things around that as well. Uh, my husband had a lot of childhood issues. He was a former foster child. He had some severe mental, physical, emotional abuse, extreme poverty, all of that. As a result, he has a real fear of abandonment, you know, as so many of us have. But his was a very deep-seated fear of abandonment. Well, if you expose yourself to somebody and you let them see you, you risk being abandoned. So he would do everything in his power to not have me leave. And that would manifest and that would play out when things were really, really good between us. His mind would start saying, ooh, things are too good and this is too good to be true. 
This is too good to last. It's fake. She's going to leave. I need an affair partner, so I'll be safe. Well, then on the flip side, we're going through a tough time. Things are difficult. We're fighting. We're not connecting. His mind would say, ooh, she's leaving. This is not good. I need an affair partner, so somebody I'll have somebody when she leaves, and I'll be safe. Yeah, that that backup plan, that backdoor plan that, you know, is like the the ugly shadow part of yourself that says, and it's actually, you know, the ugly shadow part of yourself in my experience is like a little, the little abandoned child, right? That's yes. like, I'm never going to have that feeling again. Like I'm never going to be abandoned again. I'm never going to be left again. I'm never allowing myself to get that close or that vulnerable with somebody that I would get hurt. So right. yeah, it does cause these these like protection schemes, you know, how to how to protect yourself from that. Yeah, absolutely. And then same thing, you know, on my side, I had left my career. I was staying at home. I was taking care of the kids. I was doing all of this stuff. It's not that I was helpless, but I put myself in a subservient role. I kind of martyred myself through that whole period of time. Oh, I'll take care of it all. Well, so you add those two dynamics, trauma was inevitable. <laughs> Some sort of catastrophe was inevitable. Yeah, I, you know, the martyr complex is a really interesting one because it's like we, it's actually a form of control. It's a really interesting backwards form of control where it's sort of like you owe me. Yes. Because look at all I'm doing for you. I'm doing all of this for you. And I want to do it. I love doing it for you, but you, you know, you really kind of owe me now. Or like, I'm so, you know, it's kind of like if you're in the comparison game, which like our brains automatically compare. Now the person that's kind of feeling like, gosh, I, I really got the good spouse. Um, then they're like, I really don't deserve this. And then the more kind and nice you are and the more you handle, they're like, I really don't think I deserve this now. So there's like mm -hmm. that unworthiness factor just expands, you know, and, and when people don't feel worthy in themselves, they do those shadow patterns for protection. That's how they handle it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that was the thing when I found out about this betrayal, obviously I went through this full cycle. I want to die. <laughs> I want to have my memory wiped. I can't do this. I want to kill everybody. I am so broken. I never want to stand up or see another human in my lifetime. I may, I went through it all, but what kept coming around in my head was what you mentioned earlier. This is happening for me. There is a reason for this. And what am I going to make of this? Is this going to make me a bitter, awful human? Or is this going to teach me something about that shadow? And I thought, really, that I've got a choice here. I can revenge cheat. I can do all of this stuff and let it go and probably attract a new partner and go through the same stuff again. Or I can really lean in to my darkness, to his darkness, to the darkness that we've created together and see what's here, see what's really going on. That is really a decision that is requiring a different tool set because a lot of people are wrapped up in the human drama. You know, when we operate from our reptilian brain and our limbic brain, then our life's experiences feel like they're happening to us and we end up in this victim consciousness place where we have a perpetrator and then we need to be rescued yes. or we need to do the rescuing. and. So when you're in a dynamic like that, what was so, I had that dynamic in my first marriage and it was fascinating because I started noticing, okay, I think I'm the victim and he's perpetrating on me and he thinks he's the victim and I'm perpetrating on him. And so like we wow. each, it's like amazing how you can have two victims and no perpetrators Yep. You know, like the other person is your imaginary perpetrator, but the mind does these things actually. Like I started realizing that the mind, um, because of protection schemes, is trying to like um, advance warning systems. It's trying to like, okay, anticipate when something might happen that's painful. And then it starts creating that narrative. And then it actually almost puts these glasses on where that's like all you can see is that 
you know, like you're listening to the tone of their voice. You're like watching every move you're, you know, and, and like every little decision and you're just like suspicious and, and then it starts to like put little pieces of proof together, you know, where you think, you know, and then, but of course there's no conversations happening. Like, Hey, I noticed that your, your tone seemed a little off. Are you feeling angry? Like there's no, none of that. No, no there's just like, Oh my gosh, he's angry. And then this, this almost like the, the soap opera starts and like all the plot begins and it, and you're like, just prove it to yourself, but you never actually had a conversation with the other person about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. There are so many things that we would deconstruct after the fact, like, and I, uh, cause I love what you said that there's two victims <laughs> there. <laughs> always. Yeah. Always. Because he used to always say to me, you're the only person that ever hurts me. And I would just be like, oh, that is the funniest thing. I don't know why he's saying that. I, I gave up my life for you. What do you mean? I'm the only person that ever hurt you. And it wasn't until, you know, this whole post infidelity journey that we started talking about that. And we'd be like, what do you mean by that? That was always the, the funniest phrase. I used to think that you would say it to get a rise out of me or to do something. He'd be like, no. I mean, he would take the things that I thought I was being helpful as hurt. Since he traveled a lot, since he was gone a lot, since I was managing everything, I had the belief that if I brought him in on decisions, he would feel connected and we would feel bonded and we would be a team. So I'd call him, you know, I think we're going to do this with the living room. Do you care if we paint it this color or that color? You know, the kids are doing this. Do you prefer if they're doing, and I'd ask him these questions because I thought he was, that, that was a way to bring him in. And he would be like, oh my gosh, you are incapable. You are dragging me down. You can't, you're just like trying to hook me into this relationship. Just a different perspective on things. And, you know, same thing. We had, um, my parents had gotten robbed at one point and our birth certificates were taken. Our social security cards were taken, all of that. So I went through about two years of really monitoring our finances. So every time we'd get a credit card statement or something, you know, I, I would check it. Did you, did you make this charge? Did you do this? I'm thinking I'm being proactive. I'm thinking I'm taking care of something that he won't have to mess with. He's thinking I'm controlling him financially. Two totally different points of view. All of these things that I do thinking I'm going to be the loving wife. Hey, I've got dinner at five o'clock. He's thinking that's not loving. That's controlling. He's thinking I'm hurting him. I'm thinking I'm serving him and we're hating on each other. Yeah, those perspectives are so important to really track and then to know the intention underneath what you're doing too, right? And to know your own, like this is really ultimately getting to know your own shadow and knowing yes. because where does that come from? What we learned, you know, we bring our parents into our marriage and all the dynamics that we witness with our parents, we end up bringing them into the relationship and playing them out again if we don't see them more carefully. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And then just get getting really honest and vulnerable with yourself too, because I would look at the ways that I would think, oh, I'm just being loving and by bringing him in and asking questions. When in reality, if I look at myself, that gives me an excuse to blame him if something went wrong. You told me we should do this. You said you thought gray would be better. So it's multi-layered. It's, I did what I saw my mom do, who was a very stereotypical stay-at-home mom in the, you know, 70s and 80s. I modeled that behavior, but then I had my own shadow that would come up and it would make it manipulative and controlling, but I'm not going to admit that to myself until after. <laughs> but it's hard work to do. It's really hard work. Yeah. And that's, you know, but that's just the important thing to do. And, and I think that the reason why it's hard work to do up until now in our culture is because we have many factors that contribute to this sort of um, narcissistic self-protection. You know, we're like afraid of making mistakes. We're afraid of being wrong. You know, I mean, if you just look out there in the world, you see the social media. I mean, COVID was excellent for revealing this to us because what happened was any hotly contested issue mm -hmm. all of a sudden became this audience, this people think this, 
So they're my friends if I agree with them. These people think this, they disagree with me, they are my enemy. And then it just became this like, I'm unfriending you and I'm friending you and I'm gonna talk bad about this people. Right. It Confirmation was bias, right? I mean, anything to be right. Yes, yes. Which is again about being comfortable and just staying in your own perspective and never bother to walking, walking around to the other person's point of view and just getting curious. What do you think about that? Why do you feel that way? Had we ever had a conversation about why do you feel like I am hurting you? Why do you feel like you need to bring me in on every decision? Why do you feel so much would have been revealed? Why do you feel like you have to be perfect in front of me? Why do you feel like you can't fall down? Why do you feel like you can't express these emotions? Never yeah, and those good questions, because it, it lends to some kind of like, there's going to be, I'm going to be found out for having made a mistake or been wrong or done something that I shouldn't have done or, you know, and, and, and like, actually at the end or other side, so of those conversations, those that might cause conflict there's usually a revelation that yeah. opens things up to diplomacy and peace. But see, most people, and me included in my first relationship, would try to go straight for the peace. Yes. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> bypass the conflict. Yes. But like nothing's getting resolved. And, you know, but you, and you're still, you're not, you're still in inner conflict, even if you're avoiding outer conflict by not talking about it. You're still in inner conflict. And and then because the only way to keep the peace in that scenario is pleasing and mm -hmm. avoiding and distracting, and th then it creates more problems, which yeah. grows the resentment, right? That reservoir of resentment, like you were talking about, that it, there was anger. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like to say there's three things. It's pleasing, conforming, and performing. Whenever we feel discomfort, we will automatically go into pleasing the other person, conforming to what we're supposed to be. Well, I am the perfect wife. I am the perfect mom. Just look at me. It's all fine. You know, pleasing, conforming, or then performing. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. Just tell me what you want me to do. I'll do it. And those are three big bypasses to just revealing ourselves and just standing in our truth. And it's scary to stand in our truth. And the reason that I think it's scary for so many of us to stand in our truth is we don't know what it is because nobody has ever said to us in our life, just be you in a real authentic way. So often when we hear be you, be authentic, we think of it in a performative way. Oh, I'm going to wear bright colors and I'm going to, you know, drop F-bombs or, you know, we think about it in a way that is inauthentic and it takes time and it takes work to relate to ourselves, to romance ourselves, to bring ourselves out and to get comfortable being who we are. And that's a check that I still use today. You know, when I find myself reacting or responding, am I seeking to please? Is this a bypass to peace? Am I conforming? Well, if I just look this way, it'll all be fine. Or am I, you know, dancing around performing? And it's a shock how often we default to one of those three behaviors. Yeah, that's, I love those three categorizations. Those are definitely hot button, you know, pots where you can look and go, oh yeah, there's, that's creating some friction and problem. Mm -hmm. That's like causing a lack of transparency. And, you know, one of the things I asked you about this before we started, because I was curious, um, when, when you found out that he was cheating, what was your feeling sense on like why he was looking elsewhere for like sexual intimacy? Why was he doing that? Was it because of some block that you found in yourself with sexuality or because there was a block between the two of you with connecting intimately? I mean, what was, what was it that you found? It's weird. <laughs> it's, it's weird and sorted. We always had a really good sex life. We still have a really good sex life. There, it's like so hard to, 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 to get all the words around it. He would use sex as a way, as something that he would like have to do with other women 
to get the emotional validation that he was craving. He had a really, and and some listeners might not believe this, he had a really difficult time performing with other women. He never had a difficult time performing with me because we had a really connected, bonded sex life. He used that as sex as kind of currency. Okay, if that's what I have to do to get you to pay attention to me, then I will. If that's what I have to do to get you, other women, to validate me, I will. And he also had a huge fear. I have danced burlesque um, for since, since I was 44 and I'm 53. So for nine years, I've danced burlesque. I am very open with my body. I love... I love flirting. I love dancing. I love being sensual and sexual. I'm very comfortable with that. And as part of that, I love flirting and playing with others. Now, on the one hand, he knows this about me because I have had the same personality pretty much my whole life. In his dark moments, in his fearful moments, in his, oh my God, I am being abandoned moments, he would start getting the story going in his head. She's dancing burlesque. I think she's doing that to attract other partners. I bet she's really not going out with girlfriends. I bet she's hooking up with other men. Ooh, she says she's going dancing. I bet she's meeting other partners. Ooh, I bet. And he had this whole scenario going on in his head. For a while, I was spending uh, time with girlfriends, and he even had a whole scenario in his head that I was playing around with my girlfriends and that they were more than just girlfriends. Again, none of that ever happened. It was the story in his head. And then he would come from a place of fear that it's so easy for her to find somebody. Men give her attention. It is so easy. Look at me. I, and he would call himself a fat frick. It's because I don't want to drop an (laughs) F-bomb. And he said that would go on in his head. You can't get anybody. You're just, you know, this fat, gross guy. And he said it would almost be like a game to him. Okay, I'm going to have to scrape the bottom of the barrel here. And he did scrape the bottom of the barrel. (laughs) I will have to start there and I will have to start getting my confidence up. And then once I prove to myself that I can attract these women, that I can do this for them, then I can get a little bit higher. And he said he had this whole hierarchy in his head about what he would need to do to get other women to come up to my level. That's so interesting because I've heard that same ideology from my former partner about like like he would say I'm boxing above my weight class Hmm. like you're you're more than I should have been able to attract is what he would say to me all the time like Mm -hmm. other guys more handsome than me and more profitable than me are the ones that would actually get you yeah. And so I shouldn't be married to you. Yeah. And it was like that deep insecurity. And and I'm also because I have the um in my attractor field I have um the line of attraction having to do with promiscuity mm-hmm. as the shadow expression or playfulness, like flirting as the and I'm a flirt, you know, me too. I've always <laughs> been a flirt and I have dallied a little into the, you know, a little into the promiscuity layer, but like mostly, I mean, for 20 years, well, for 18 years of our relationship, I was completely faithful, but I don't think he believed it. Yes. You know, and it was that constant like pressure. What I did in response, what I did in response to that sort of deep insecurity that he always had was like I shut down my my attractor field. Like I shut down that playfulness and that flirtiness. Mm-hmm. And I because he would get uncomfortable around it. And I would like like close the aperture, you know, just so he's more comfortable. Yes. But what happened was that I shut myself down. Yes. And my own power and my own like so that that had a limited lifetime um, of a way that it could be in effect because it like led me into this really dark place where I wasn't really being myself mm-hmm. and I wasn't comfortable around other people. I mean, I was being around other people because I'm supposed I'm a sage. I'm supposed to be around other people. So uh, like 
being around people, but like always afraid that they're going to find me attractive. And then I will have somehow done something wrong to make my partner feel bad that, and it's just like, uh, I'm just being me. So I broke out of it for like, I got rebellious. I finally got to the end of it when I was in that effort moment. And I just, that's, that's the last two years of our marriage. I was like, nope, fuck it, man. I'm out of here. And it yeah. was like the most free I ever felt. Like I was so free. And I was, you know, I was, um, I mean, I was definitely attracting partners from the need for validation and all of that. But, but still, I was, my sexuality itself, my attractor field was free at last, you know? And then I got married again. You know, so like you said, like if it doesn't get resolved, it didn't get resolved for me. Right. You know, so now my partner and I are working through it. So it's like, okay, it's not totally resolved because I am going to get out there. I mean, I'm out there. I'm a sage. I'm supposed to be around people. I'm supposed to be having conversations. I'm supposed to be mingling. I, I have expressions. I'm a sage. I've got so many expressions. You wouldn't even count how many I have. So yeah, flirtatious. Yeah. And I'm a woman. And I, yeah. you know, I, I'm still attractive. So like, yeah, people look at me and, but I don't, I don't pay attention. I actually don't pay attention to it. I don't really notice it. It just happens all the time. I don't, just don't look at it, but he notices everything. He notices every single moment that somebody's looking at me. Did you know that those guys were looking at your butt when you turned, when you bent over? I said, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> I did not notice. He's like, did you notice how many times that guy's eyes went down to your chest when you were talking? I said, No. I didn't notice. Right. No, I don't notice. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like that, okay, I don't notice. And then, you know, my response to my husband then and now would be, yeah, but if I would have, I would have started shimming, you know, because it's fun. It's playful. Let's lean into it. And I don't take it as a threat because I know my boundaries and I would see him starting to move into his flirtatiousness. And I would think, yay, good for you because flirting is being connected with your sensual energy and your playfulness and your fun. I never thought he was taking it seriously because I never took it seriously. Yeah. And that's really the big, I think that's probably one of the biggest realizations is um, they are taking it seriously. You know, like in my case that he was taking it seriously and he took actions that, you know, I didn't know about. And it's like, wow. And of course, I think that anytime that somebody's doing that, there is like some little part of you that knows that that's going on. Yes. And, um, you know, maybe you don't consciously admit it or recognize it till much later, but you know, I mean, you start asking questions like, what's, what's your relationship with so-and-so? Oh, there's nothing, nothing, you know, no, no big deal there. You know, it's like, uh, why am I wanting to ask these questions about that relationship all the time? Mm -hmm. But I had my rose colored glasses on mm -hmm. and I was conflict avoiding and I was in my pleaser mode. I didn't want to know about all that. Mm -hmm. Right. I just wanted to live my life and pretend like it was perfect. And like you said, that we're a team and we're working towards all these projects. So like in every other area it seems to be working, right? Because you're working together to remodel the house or to help the kids with school or, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. You just don't catch these deeper intimate moments yeah. until you know what deep intimacy actually looks like and feels like. Yeah, absolutely. And as part of that too, we had a very different view of marriage. I grew up, uh, my parents are still together. Were there problems? Of course there were problems. They would fight, they would get over it. They would fight, they would get over it. I thought fighting was normal. I thought having conflict was normal. I thought in the end, everybody's always happy. My husband comes from a broken home. His mom has been married umpteen different times. In his view, you fight, the relationship ends, it's over. You fight, another relationship ends, it's over. So again, if we had a fight, threat level, Laura, eh, one. Threat level, Sean, eight, nine. 
that is a huge thing to recognize as well, right? It's like, what does this mean to you and what does this mean to me? And that's where like really understanding each other's backgrounds. I mean, a lot of times we don't even know that about ourselves, right? It takes, it takes these situations to unfold and our willingness to be transparent, vulnerable, and open up. And also, I believe, let the love be the most important thing in the space. Yes. Because protecting that, I mean, once you go single, you find out, like, it's pretty challenging to find that next person that you're really compatible with, you know, that you can really trust and listen to and work with. Like, it is challenging. It's not just everybody, you know. It takes a special person to, to be that good match for you. So, you know, when you find that and you find that love connection, you don't just want to toss it away, you know, so quickly, right? We need to lean in. Right. Right. And that's the thing. We are both leaning in to figure out what we can figure out about ourselves. We sometimes laugh that we're both very selfish about things now, but it's a healthy selfish. I'm leaning in so I can learn everything about myself and my shadow and my beliefs. Like you said earlier, I would have never verbalized what I think a good marriage is like. I would have never verbalized what feels threatening in a marriage. I had never experienced it. How would I know? I would have never known to ask a partner that. Now I know that. I am leaning fully into finding everything out about myself. I've got some warped beliefs about what a, what a good woman is. I would have never thought about that. He's leaning fully into finding out about himself and his shadow and, you know, taking different spiritual paths and doing some studying and working through things. It is also leading us closer together. And if it doesn't, that's fine too. We can love and support each other through that separation because our focus now is on really uninhibited growth, on eking as much out of this. That's what I love about, you know, soul nectar, the name of your show. That's what we're doing. We're like squeezing the nectar out of our souls as much as we possibly can. And if that means togetherness, wonderful, because boy, do we enjoy each other. And if that means that we have to separate, wonderful, because that also means that we're both supporting each other to our highest and fullest. And there's a real release of fear about that and a real openness to bring me everything, bring me everything, bring him everything, and we'll just see what happens. And that's that, that's what I was talking about at the beginning, that that intention, right? That knowledge of yourself and what the relationship is for. It's like, um, I had a rewiring where, you know, when I had the first marriage, it was a very traditional marriage, like till death do you part, you know, and that whole thing, you know? And then the second time it's been really about as long as it matches our soul's curriculums and it's helping each of us to reach our highest and best good along our path of soul evolution. Like that is what it's about and we don't have any back doors so you know we're in it until we decide not to be in it we're in it together and i think that's important to not have any back doors because the ego is so dang clever um to you know create ways to stop the love and so we got to lean in and and confront that a little bit more and see what happens on the other side. Take some faith and trust, but I hope that um, anyone listening to this um, interview today with Laura has seen that it's possible and that, um, you know, good outcomes can come from it. And if anything, growth, personal growth. So always, always the purpose that I have. So Laura, I know that you have um, a free gift, the top three ways you betray yourself every day and how to stop. And I'm going to provide that link. Is there anything else that you, um, it's, by the way, for everybody, it's burnoutorbetrayal.com is the website. It will be in the show notes. Um, is there anything else you want to just say to people on the way out? You know, it's sort of like a parting little bit of wisdom. Yeah. The little bit of wisdom, you just touched on it right there, is no matter what, allow that love to flow. You know, our human idea of what is good and what is bad and what is loving and what is painful is so limited and just constantly returning to your heart and allowing that love to flow. That love will take whatever form is in the best and highest good for everyone. And that is my parting shot. Just always go to your heart and let the love flow. 
let the love flow people well speaking of letting the love flow um send us some love over at soul nectar show give us a like a subscribe a comment please on your way out of this interview take a moment to pause and give us a rating it just helps us to grow our audience and our influence and reach more people who might be having this exact issue right now in their lives and need this interview and this wisdom to get through it with more grace. We appreciate you for doing that. And we're gonna give you kisses now. You wanna join me? We're gonna give kisses for everybody. Here they come, everybody. We love you. Love you people. We'll see you next time on Soul Nectar Show, everybody. Bye for now. If you found even one gold nugget in this episode of Soul Nectar Show, will you do us a favor? Will you subscribe, like, and share this episode? Maybe even write a comment and let us know what you thought about it. We really, really want to engage with you at a much deeper level. Let's be part of community together. Have a great week, everyone. Bye for now. To dive in deeper to nourishing conversation, visit soulnectar.show. Soul Nectar Show. Awaken the Soul Nectar Show. Take a sip from the drip of nectar from the source of who you are. Soul Nectar Show. Yeah. Yeah.